Katie Books Productions presents Lenny Gray, an audio drama, written, produced, and narrated by Earl Sewell. Previously on Lenny Gray. His eye was lifeless. It was just a small brown circle of emptiness. She opened up the other eyelid, and it wasn't there. It had rolled up into his skull. With the next breath, grief clamped down on Lenny Gray and began to choke the life out of her. It was as if someone had poured a pail of bitterly cold ice water down her back. She bucked her spine and arched her head back and tearfully gazed up at the sky. Her mouth opened wide and she attempted to howl out mournfully, but no sound would pass through her lips. Her chest ballooned with stiffening pain until she was only able to take in short wisps of air. When her body could no longer inhale air, it stopped moving as if every part of her being had become unexplainably lifeless and frozen in time. Finally, her body yielded and allowed her to exhale, forcing Lenny Gray to scream out in grief-stricken anguish at the top of her voice. After Lenny Gray bawled, an odd stillness settled around her. Time froze, and she felt numb. In her mind, she believed a wicked demon had poked a hole in the world and snatched Tommy from her when she wasn't looking. She could still feel the vibrations of her voice fluttering rapidly on the floor of her mouth, but did not hear the sound she made. Her eyes watered, and her vision blurred. She felt a tugging at her arm. She looked at the blurry silhouette and realized it was Ida, attempting to take Tommy away from her. Jerking away, she held onto him tighter and made incoherent sounds that she did not recognize. She rose to her feet and began walking through the cotton field. She told herself that she was walking toward the horizon to talk to God and to ask for Tommy back. She wanted to tell God that she had made a mistake and should have stayed home to take care of him instead of work in the fields. The other field workers stopped and looked curiously at Lenny Gray. Looking at the anguish on Lenny Gray's face as she held onto the limp and broken body of her child, the field workers empathized and felt their emotions mirror the ones that Lenny Gray were moving through. No one spoke as she meandered past them towards the horizon. Lenny, turn around. She finally heard a voice pleading with her. Lenny, let me hide a child, she heard a voice say. It was Ida. Lenny, where are you going with this baby? Ida asked. Curly, uh, be here soon. It's Curly's fault. That's the reason the demon took Tommy. Curly be asking the devil for favors, and the devil come to collect again, whispered Lenny Gray, continuing to lumber forward. Her bare feet were sinking into the soft dirt with every step she took. Lenny, I I think you done flipped out, child. Where you going, honey? 
You can't walk around carrying Tommy like that, Ida said as she positioned herself in front of Lenny Gray to block her path. I'm going to see God and Mr. Moon about this, Lenny Gray said. Lenny, God busy right now, and you don't know nobody named Mr. Moon. Mr. Moon followed me to the railroad track the night you made me marry Curly. I didn't want to marry Curly. He crazy. Just like he... Oh, God, he crazy. Just like his daddy. Just like you. Y'all are some crazy people. Lenny Gray stared into Ida's eyes. You the one who wanted to talk about making pretty papers with your son who got ugliness a hole in him. I don't want to suffer no more. I can't take it. Lenny, your words done cut me real deep. It hurt, but you got to listen to me. Tommy was sick. Been that way since he was born. Ida tried to reason with Lenny Gray. I nursed him to good health, and a demon took him because of Curly. Don't you see that? Lenny Gray felt constriction in her throat. She couldn't speak anymore. All she could do was cry and hum. Then, walking out of the distant horizon towards her, she saw a silhouette. She recognized it. It was John, the one-armed gravedigger, walking towards her. It was evening, and Mary was standing behind Lenny Gray, who was sitting on a makeshift chair. Candles were burning, and Mary was brushing Lenny Gray's hair and humming a spiritual song. Lenny Gray was lost somewhere deep in herself. She hadn't spoken a word since Tommy passed away. Tommy was put to rest on a Sunday. All of the other people from the shanties came by with sorrow-filled eyes. They bought food, and they came to pay their respect. Willie, where daddy at? Mary asked her brother, who was sitting on the floor thumbing through an old periodical that Tangie Mae used to read. You at the cemetery? Willie answered as he held the page up to the candlelight. What do all this here mean? Willie asked, pointing to the words on the page. Those are words, boy, Mary answered. Stop acting like you don't know that. I know they're words, but what do they say? I only got as far as the second grade, and I ain't been back to school since, Willie asked. I ain't got time for that now. Go get Daddy. I ain't got to do what you say, Willie said, and continued to flip through the pages. Mama said to go get Daddy. Mary spoke louder and more sternly. Mama ain't say that. Go on, Willie, Mary cajoled. It's too dark out there. Take one of the kerosene lamps. Mary insisted. Willie stopped being difficult and reluctantly took a lamp and moved towards the front door. But you coming with me? Willie asked his brother, who was positioned against the wall on the floor. I, I, I ain't going out there. It's, it, 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 it's too, 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 too dark. Willie, hurry up, you hear? Mary said. Daddy ought not be out at all times of night. Mama need him here for comforting. I'll tell him. Willie huffed before he walked out of the door. Thirty minutes later, Willie burst into the front doorway, sweaty and breathless. He fell to his knees and crawled over onto the floor where his brother Bud was still resting. What's wrong? What happened? Mary asked nervously as she braided Lenny Gray's hair. Willie tried to regulate his breathing. Daddy done gone crazy, he said, panic-stricken. What? Mary's voice rose several octaves as she tried to understand and process what Willie was attempting to say. I went down to the graveyard and saw him, but he didn't see me, Willie explained, now that he had gotten his breathing more regulated. Well, what was he doing? Mary asked. Standing in the moonlight talking, Willie said. Talking the who? Mary asked, focusing all of her attention on his every word. Okay, he was talking to John, the one-armed gravedigger. They were sitting on the tree stump drinking together. John kept filling Papa's cup, and he just kept drinking. I heard Papa say, I don't want to feel nothing. And then, John whispered something into Papa's ear. Then, Papa started yelling and shouting and carrying on. 
John laughed at him, and then he left. Wow. Well, what was he saying when he was shouting? He say, God, if you so big and bad, kill me right now. Then he say, I gave Tommy life, and you ain't had no right to take him away from me. Then he pulled out that old pistol of his and started shooting at the sky. Shooting at the sky? Mary said as more of a confused statement than a question. How long did he shoot at the sky? Till he ran out of bullets. Then he just started crying and calling out Thomas' name. He got tired, I guess, and fell to his knees by the tree stump. Then it sounded like something started answering him because Daddy started saying, What'd you say? Then he stood up and started throwing punches like this. Willie demonstrated for her. He threw one punch so hard that he spun around to the ground and fell. Who was he fighting? Mary asked. Don't know. He got back up and he started swinging and punching like he was fighting for his life. But there wasn't nobody around him. The way Papa was carrying on, I thought he was fighting a bunch of folks. Then I guess he got tired again because he fell to the ground again right where Tommy was buried and he just started crying. Well, was he okay? Mary asked, feeling tears swelling up in the back of her eyes. Oh, no. Willie shrugged his shoulders. I wasn't about to go and mess with him. Not when he was like that. I got sense enough not to do that. Bud, Mary called to him. What? Bud answered. Go get Grandpa Tom. Tell him what's going on. He'll know what to do. Sighing loudly, Lenny Gray broke her silence. I told him not to play around with evil. I've been telling him for years. Now, he out there suffering. In spite of Curly's flaws, shortcomings, and abusive behavior, over the years, she had figured out things about him that he had not realized. Curly was a man captured, lost, and had a tortured soul. She looked deeply into the eyes of Bud and Willie and saw Curly in each of them. Then with strength, courage, and great difficulty, Lenny Gray rose up, grabbed a kerosene lamp, and headed out the door. Where you going, Mama? To go get him before he brings more unavoidable suffering on this family. In August of the following year, Lenny Gray and Curly were able to save enough money to get a sow, a few chickens, and a rooster. Curly and Lenny Gray cultivated a patch of land near their shanty and planted tomatoes, cucumbers, peas, corn, cabbage, peanuts, watermelon, and carrots. Bud, Willie, and Minnie also helped to tend to the garden. One hot evening, Lenny Gray and Curly were sitting on the front porch drinking sweet tea. Lenny Gray was flickering a paper fan back and forth to keep her and Minnie cool. Willie and Bud amused themselves by having foot races around the shanty. Curly? Who that coming down the road? Lenny Gray pointed to an approaching car. Uh, Look like Mr. Bettis' car to me, Curly said, rising up. After a moment, the black car pulled up and stopped in front of Curly's shanty. How are you doing today, Curly? asked Mr. Bettis, trying to sound like they were old friends and not adversaries. I, Curly answered as he approached the car. Mr. Bettis had gotten older and had ballooned into a burly man who liked to smoke cigars. He had red cheeks and white whiskers. He looked past Curly and waved at Lenny Gray. How are you doing, Lenny? Just trying to keep cool, she answered with fake enthusiasm suppressing the urge to spit and call him foul names on account of what he did to Tangy May. Looks like Curly has gotten you pregnant again, Mr. Bettis smiled. Yeah, I'll be having a baby this fall. Lenny Gray looked down at Minnie and gave her a sip of her sweet tea. How old is that little one right there? Just turned six not long ago, answered Lenny Gray. Willie and Bud came sprinting from around the rear of the house. When they saw the car, they stopped. Them two there are yours as well, right, Curly? Asked Mr. Bettis, pointing to the boys. Uh, yes, sir. That's uh, Bud and that's Willie. Uh, uh, Willie's my oldest boy. Uh, he twelve and Bud is eleven. Good. Young ones like that come in handy. 
Make sure you keep them boys strong and healthy so they can help you work out in the field. Uh, yes, sir. They is a great help to me out there. And the little girl should start helping out as soon as next season. I got cotton bags that are small enough for her, Mr. Bettis said with a smile. Oh, I, I plan to make sure she help out, sir, said Curly, looking back at his daughter. Mr. Bettis looked directly at Willie when he spoke. What are you boys doing? Racing, Willie answered. Is that right? Mr. Bettis looked curiously at them. Well, you know that boy Jesse Owens then went over there and won in Germany, Mr. Bettis said bitterly. Uh, no, I don't know nothing about that, sir, Curly said. You mean to tell me that you ain't heard nothing about Jesse Owens? Mr. Bettis looked surprised. Uh, no, I ain't never met him, Curly said. Mr. Bettis laughed. Curly, you tickle me. The only things you know how to do is make a baby and plow a field. Mr. Bettis reached over into Ida's car on the passenger seat and handed Curly the newspaper that was there. See this here picture? That's the Owens boy. Says he won four gold medals. Uh, was he from around here? Curly asked. Curly, use your head, boy. I would never allow an uppity nigger like Jesse Owens on my land. It's people like you that are a credit to your race, not him. Hell, I hate the fact that those damned Olympic people allowed him to race. The Olympics is a white man's pleasure, and the most that the Owens boy should have been doing is cleaning toilets. You see, Curly, I like you. You work hard, you don't cause no trouble, and you're doing more breeding of children so that they can work my land. You're a good boy, Curly. That's why you and your family are protected from trouble around here. Hell, just a few days ago, Roy and J.W. had to put a boy in his place for thinking that he deserved a better position in life. Deep lines formed in Mr. Bettis' forehead as he told Curly about it. Curly humbly said, uh, 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 Thank you, sir. I'm glad to know that my family is protected and that you like uh, our work out in the field. Curly, I'm going to show you just how much I like you. Tell them boys to come over here. Mr. Bettis reached into the back seat of his car and grabbed a grocery bag. Curly motioned for his sons. Uh, will it, bud? Uh, get over here. I got a stick of peppermint candy for each of you boys, said Mr. Bettis, handing them the red and white striped candy. Willie and Bud eagerly took it. Curly prompted them so that they wouldn't forget their manners. D -d 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 Thank you, they both said. Well, Curly, you can keep the newspaper. Oh, and I'll put the price of the peppermint candy on your account. Uh, uh, thank you, sir, said Curly. All right, gal, take care, Mr. Bettis said as he waved to Lenny Gray. Curly held onto the newspaper and looked at the photograph of Jesse Owens with the winning medals around his neck. It confused him as to why Mr. Bettis would say that he didn't think Jesse Owens should have run, but he had bought it to him like it was something important. A shift happened inside of Curly's mind. Did Mr. Bettis really like him, or did he hate him? Curly didn't know how to tell the difference because he had a difficult time understanding how Mr. Bettis could smile at him and say something mean-spirited at the same time.